Hello, and welcome to the Caterpillar Construction webinar series. My name is Jason Hurtis, and I'll be your host today, where we're coming to you live from the TV studios in the metropolis of Peoria, Illinois. Our topic today for this webinar is machine choices, how to ensure that you're selecting the right machine for your application based on all the choices from the different manufacturers that you have available today. I'm joined by two Caterpillar experts, Christian Duarte and Lonnie Fritz. Christian, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about what you do at Caterpillar and what your roles and responsibilities are. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. I'm Christian Duarte. I've been with Cat for nine and a half years. And uh, the last four years, I've had the privilege of supporting dealers and customers in the Southeast. So what I do day in and day out is support dealers and customers. And again, we appreciate you coming all the way up and, and spending the day with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Lonnie, can you introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lonnie Fritz, as Jason mentioned. Um, I am a heavy construction market professional here at Caterpillar. About three years now, um, prior to joining Caterpillar, I was a CAT customer and a uh, heavy highway construction project manager. Perfect. Thank you again for spending the day yeah, with us. Absolutely. Again, my name is Jason Hurtis. I'm a global market professional for Caterpillar. I will also be your host. Before we get started with our topic today, we have to cover a little bit of housekeeping. So if you look at the screen in front of you, I'm going to start in your upper left-hand corner. That will, that's where you'll find the profiles for Lonnie, Christian, and myself, our LinkedIn profiles. You can click on those. You can find out more information about us as well as contact us with any questions that you may have. Moving to your lower left, you'll find another box, and inside that box will be a lot of links to what we're talking about today, some of the visuals that the guys have provided. Um, two of the links I do want to draw your attention to is the uh, newsletter. I'd like you to sign up for that. You'll get advanced notification of our webinars um, that will be continuing in 2018, as well as additional information on Caterpillar's product, services, solutions, and technologies. So let's move to the right side of your screen, if you will, and look at the lower right-hand corner. That is the question box. So if you have a question at any time throughout this webinar for any of our guests, simply type it in there. It'll come up here on my iPad, and we'll try to address it as we go, out through, the, uh, go through the conversation. If not, we all have time at the end to address those questions um, that you may have. Speaking of questions, you will also uh, be asked to conduct uh, what we're calling viewer poll questions. So a question will pop up on your screen. We're going to ask you for an answer. Um, it'll be a simple multiple choice, you know, up, down, left, right, nothing complex, no essays, uh, to help us guide the conversation again with our experts and make sure that we're delivering what you're expecting. Last but not least, at the very bottom of your screen, you're going to see a roll of uh, icons of different colors. The only one I want to draw your attention to is the question mark button. If you have any trouble, um, you know, audio or visual throughout this webinar, simply hit that question mark button. You'll be put in contact with one of our on, on live uh, or live on, on support tech staff that will help you through any audio or visual problems that you may have. So with that out of the way, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. And we're going to start talking about what we're going to cover today. Again, which is simplifying the machine selection, because there are lots of choices out in the marketplace today. Mm -hmm. uh, Nomenclature is changing. Weights of excavators are changing. Um, wheel loader platforms are changing. Um, older platforms are now being brought back into production again to fit certain application needs. Um, and how Caterpillar, as well as other manufacturers, are, are reacting to the shift in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You know, where there's different customer needs based on what application or what job you're doing, how you select and how you put a, a machine in those applications. And then also um, from just a specific Caterpillar standpoint, you know, what is, a, what is this GC thing? What is a standard machine? What is an XE model? Where do they fit? What are they all about? Um, so those are the things that we'd like you guys to cover today if you, if you could help us understand what the market's doing and how to apply the different machines and products that you have today to the different market segments or different applications. Sure. Sound fair? Sure, yeah. Absolutely. To get us started, you're going to see a viewer poll question come up on your screen. And the question is going to be, how would you describe what you know about Caterpillar uh, GC and XE products? For example, a 320 GC or the 336 FXE, the 950 GC, which has been out for a while, or the 972 MXE. So what do you know about those products currently? Again, that would help me gauge the conversation of, of how deep we go or where we take the conversation with our experts. Your answers are, I don't know enough to make a purchase decision. I have a good understanding. I think this thing's totally confusing and I'm lost. And I'm hoping this webinar will fill in the gaps. 
Again, if you would take a couple minutes to select one of those answers, it'll come up live on my screen here. And again, that will help me direct the conversation with the guys. The 320 GC is a, has just been launched, right? That's one of the newest yes. models? Absolutely, yeah. Just launched here about a month ago, so uh, coming out in the marketplace here very soon. And the GC, Christian's been out for two years, a year? Close to a year and a half. Close to so, a year and, and a half? You know, on the ground, we've been working on it, yeah, close to two years now, trying to get to market. Okay. And the XE model is about the same time frame, if I remember correctly, Absolutely. about a year or so? Yeah. Okay. All right, your poll questions are coming back. I have a pretty good understanding, and you're hoping that this webinar will fill in the gaps. So I guess we know what our mission is in front of us and <laughs> what we need to do. Not bad. And it's split evenly between 50-50. Yeah. So we won't dive into the, the nitty-gritty details. I mean, we'll keep it kind of high profile, but yet give you enough details where if you did have any additional questions, this webinar will go ahead and, and fill in the gaps for you. So moving to our first, or our next chapter, and that's the big question, why is Caterpillar mm -hmm. manufacturing GC and XE models, and why are they offering three? Yeah. What's changed in the market? You know, what are you guys seeing out there of, of why Caterpillar needs a couple different distinct mm -hmm. machine platforms? What, why are our customers needing things that are different than what they were in the past? Well, as always, Caterpillar, uh prides itself in leveraging voice to customer, we call it VOC. So uh, first and foremost, we have a lot of measures in place where we go out and really harvest that voice of customer, really hear what our customers need as far as the machines for their applications. Um, again, um, now more than ever before, our customers have choices. We've listened to their needs, their applications, and we've developed a platform starting with the excavators in the 320 GC, the 320, and the 323. Again, our customers have asked for reliability, durability, um, low operating costs, that low cost per hour of operation, as well as uh, efficient machines when we start looking at fuel, for example. Um, so taking all that voice of customer back to our R&D folks here and inside Caterpillar and really developing machines that I like to say uh, machines that are developed uh, to match the mission, uh, the right tool for the right job. So more so than ever before where it was just one premium branded, let's say the 320F, and that was our only 20 ton offering, we now are providing the customer with choices to align with their needs. And I think to that point, I don't think it's up the market has changed. The working envelope and what customers are doing with the machines is still the same work at hand is how we all look at how we need to get it accomplished has changed where we're leveraging more data, more details. So it's us as OEMs trying to design machines that fit the application better for what the customer's intending to do and having that right tool for the right job depending on load times and cycles and you know application profile and all that. I've heard a lot about some manufacturers, Caterpillar is uh, specifically, you know, has kind of segmented the market into, mm -hmm. into three buckets, if you will, a, a light duty segment or application profile, a performance segment profile, and, and then a high performance or, or mm -hmm. a high production type segment. Can you guys yeah. define a little bit more behind what mm -hmm. went into those segment definitions and, and yeah. what those applications kind of look like? Yeah, so if we take the new platform of excavators, for example, Jason, you hit a couple key words there. Uh, let's look at the 320 GC, again, looking for uh, reliability, lowest ownership cost, um, operating cost. So again, that 320 GC brings in a lot of benefits, a simplified machine. A machine being more simplified drives down the um, repairability and the maintenance needs. Um, again, lower technology on that machine. Um, the 320 fits into that sweet spot more utilization of technology, looking at efficiencies of fuel, operator efficiency. Uh, the 323 then gets into those more heavy duty applications where we might be into more hammering, for example, using the work tool and, and breaking up um, different materials um, into uh, more production driven um, for revenue opportunities and maybe some stiffer soils. Think of an underground utilities, for example, where I really need more lifting capacity and driving down cycle time trying to um, put a machine in each of those categories. So if you look at it in summary real quick, it's looking at that low to moderate utilization in light to medium duty applications for the GC. Then we step up to more of those uh, medium to high um, utilization rates and those Which moderate the, to high applications. The Application profile. Yeah, the starting to segment. yeah, starting to bleed over into that performance segment, Jason. Exactly, and then the 323 comes with that 
greater size engine, larger engine, more lifting capacity, really driving down, like I said, those cycle times in those heavy duty applications. Which would be the last segment or the, the high production Absolutely. Got to get the job done no matter yep. what it costs, yep. no matter what it takes. Really focused on productivity, leveraging technology, and we can get more into the technology side as we progress here. And exactly the same for the wheel loaders. I mean, the three segmentations that we look at is for us to look at commonality of, you know, the application at hand and what the customers need to do and how they get paid, uh, whether it's by ton or, or cost per hour. And it's really developing a machine that will suit, you know, an application and make it the best tool for the job rather than, you know, one fits all. Okay. So if we look at light performance and high production environments, we have, you know, different machines to fit each application, starting with the 950 GC and what it can do, uh, you know, still counting on the reliability and, and that we expect from the CAT machine, but, you know, exactly just fitting it to the right application. And then as we go up into performance, high production, you know, we look 950M, and performance and its reliability, durability, and working envelope and capacity of what it can do. And then you look at the performance segment and you're looking at XC, you know, uh, a lot more technology on it as far as what's built into the machine to help be a, you know, a, a production machine that it's counted on to deliver tonnage or cycles or trucks or whatever is at okay. hand for it. So the overall intent is is not to give the masses one machine that Absolutely. may be over-equipped or under-equipped right. based on what you want to do. It's to build a machine specifically to maximize that customer's owning and operating costs and return on investment, exactly. correct? I mean, that's Absolutely. kind of the reason behind the whole segmentation. Right. Yep. Perfect. Let's move into another chapter, and we're going to talk about more product-specific based okay. on these three market segments, the light duty, the performance, the high production, or the, mm -hmm. or the high performance segment. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, a machine in the light duty segment. What is that typical machine that... that we would build or specify for that segment and what are some of the key characteristics of those machines that fit mm -hmm. that market segment we just defined. Yeah, so in the light duty segment, Jason, again with the new platform of excavators that uh, we just recently launched, being specifically the 320GC, um, again fits into that low to moderate utilization, um, lesser feature in technology again, rear camera, product link going into vision link and that's where we draw the line on um, those machines. Um, scalable technology really falls into the 320 and the 323. Um, again, looking at driving down, basing our decisions on utilization and operating cost, um, that simplified machine. So again, that 320 GC fits in real nice there. Uh, think of it, for example, I just learned best by example, um, let's just take a farmer. Maybe a farmer that wants to use that machine on an average of five, 10 hours a week, you know, looking at a low acquisition price that right price point and really getting in there at a low operating cost to maybe just clean out its drainage ditches or do a little ditch excavation here, some uh, supplemental work around the farm, for example. Not looking at high productivity where it's got to be the production machine laying pipe digging 10 feet deep in a real stiff clay, for example. Now we're starting to get over in that 320, 323, like you said, Jason, that performance area. Um, so again, fitting into those applications. Wheel loader is very similar, Christian? Very similar. If you look at the 950 GC, you know, same reliability that you would expect from a cap machine um, that's built into it, but but simplified. So you get into the cap of the machine, you know, you, you kind of get in it, and it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that you'd expect as you're jumping from the M to the GC, but definitely built to do the job. And if, what are the what is the job that we're looking at? It, you know, from my experience talking to customers in the southeast, it would be, 950 GC and, you know, utility pipe crew matching up to a 336 swift coupler bucket and forks and really helping that 336 keep digging the trench and, you know, upkeeping with that level of production. So it's more of a, a unit that's supporting a, a given application and it really fits that application where, where it has what it takes to do that job. One of the questions that we've gotten in from the audience is, what does GC mean? Does GC stand for something, or <laughs> nothing. what's behind the nomenclature decision of, of yeah, a GC? Can you absolutely. explain that a little bit? Yeah, excellent question. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, um, GC stands for this, nothing. Uh, GC is just a modifier, uh, I should say more or less an identifier on the side of the machine. Uh, G doesn't mean anything and C doesn't mean anything. It's just simply that level of machine uh, still bring again reliability, durability, lowest operating cost. It's just a way we identify that machine and how it is different when we look at the side panel on the machine versus a 320 or a 323. Um, so yeah, GC is not an acronym for anything. Okay. Let's move into the, the middle segment, the performance segment, if you will, and talk a little bit about 
you know, what's on those machines, how those machines are spec to, to fit the needs of a performance segment sure. application profile. Yeah, so we start working, moving our way over and progressing into the performance side of things. Um, specific to the excavators, uh, staying with the 20 ton size class, we're looking at the 320, the 323, Jason. And I alluded to this here a few minutes ago is uh, the, the technology uh, that comes standard out of the factory on the 320 and the 323 is the grade, the e-fence, the assist, the payload technology. So now the customer is valuing that technology in more of a production-related machine uh, to leverage efficiencies, operator efficiencies, um, trying to take away some of the inputs from the operator that's going to live in that machine for an 8, 10, 12-hour shift. Different than that GC, the guy's just going to go out for a couple hours and dig around the ditch for example. Um, so with those intuitive controls and those features we're giving that operator, it's driving down operator fatigue, it's making some of those uh, movements semi-autonomous um, in the automatic side, for example, like e-swing, setting those targets. So really, again, when we start looking at technology, that's a big driver and a big differentiator when you start looking at GC versus 20 and 23. Um, again, standard out of the factory, scalable technology when you start putting on 2D advanced technology as well as 3D grade control. Um, so it's really amping up the game and where that machine is really going to have what? Increased utilization, getting into those medium and heavy duty applications and utilization in that fuel consumption really being up there and driving fuel efficiency due to those technologies and, uh, and really driving down unit and overall cost to the customer, i.e. increase in profitability. For the wheel loaders, same same methodology. As we look at the M series lineup, you know, 950 M, 62, 66, 72, 80, and 82, it's it's that no longer guest machine. It's more of the star of the operation. You have more of the features in the cab built into the machine, designed to give the operator different abilities to, to change the configuration of the machine, to change to you know to the working envelope. So to, the, adapt to, to, to adapt to adapt to the task at hand. So. A lot more flexible, a lot more uh, technology built into it to help the, the operator know that. So it's more of your, your 20 year operator who's been with you for a while and that's the guy that you want to reward with the higher productive machine that has more options for him to be a better operator and a better asset for the company. Okay, perfect. Let's move into our very last segment. And again, mm -hmm. same question, help us figure out what machines would go where, why those machines would apply, and that's the high production or, or the high performance. Mm -hmm application profile, if you will. Yeah, so um, the machine that aligns best, and again, staying with excavators on my end of things here in the 323, um, again, you mentioned it, Jason, high productivity, again, reliability and durability, fully featured on technology as well as the scalability. Um, in those heavy duty applications, um, this machine comes with a bigger engine, the C7.1, for example, increasing horsepower and output when that operator is really demanding response from that machine and pulling back on those levers. Um, the engine, the hydraulic system, really has the capability it needs for increasing, like Christian mentions with the wheel loaders, that working envelope, increased lifting capacity. So again, just where I'm passionate, have a lot of experience, and think of underground utilities, you know, wanting to set that six foot, even that eight foot diameter manhole, maybe 10, 15 feet deep, digging through a really stiff clay, um, or any other materials like that. Uh, excessive hammering, a lot of hammering going on in rock and what have you, with that heavy duty undercarriage, heavier counterweight, this is the machine that's really going to go in there and work on those heavy duty applications and respond very well for the customer. Again, using that fully featured factory integrated technology, um, intuitive controls driving down operator fatigue, and again, uh, making the customer more profitable as this machine is really focused on heavy duty applications, productivity, and those efficiencies. And for the wheel loaders, we, we talked a little bit about GC. Wheel loader, we're talking XC, so we're talking 9, you know, 966, whole, XC, 972. So it's though. the other end of the spectrum. We're talking application, uh, specific machine, dedicated machine, very, you know, we're looking at tons per hour. We're measuring how much that machine, the, the, you know, the throughput the machine can do for, for the customer. So if we're loading trucks and you're talking, you know, 20, 20, 30 trucks per hour or, or tonnage that you need to cycle out of the batch plant or whatnot, the XE, what it has in the technology and R&D we've put into it is to lower the O&O &O cost, improve fuel efficiency by lowering the fuel consumption and maintaining it, not improving how much they can, the loader can load into a given, you know, hopper, trucks or what it has to do but it's fully dedicated machine to do that, that job and do it best. 
Okay. And Jason, just to underscore that to Kristen's, Christian's point there, um, again, as we think about these GC, and we're bringing you so many choices. Like I used to say when I was in the field, um, if the 330 wasn't big enough, I just called for a 345. Um, we're giving you more choices today, so the application has to really be looked at. But the point being is, on a 320 GC, that's really focusing on that lowest operating cost. And that's the customer that's out there really conscientious about the cost per hour. As you've mentioned, Jason, many times getting that performance side, now we're really looking at productivity and driving down unit costs. So now we're going from hourly cost over to unit cost because I get paid by what I am doing. You know, it's the feet of pipe, it's the cubic yards of earth, et cetera. So again, that's kind of just to drive that a little bit more clear in maybe your minds as to why all these choices. Again, can't say enough, right tool for the right job, and we're giving you those opportunities and those choices. We have another question, and I'm sure you guys have already anticipated what this one is based on the GC question. XE, does mm -hmm. it stand for anything, and, and why is that now part of the, the nomenclature? Yeah, again, just like GC, folks, uh, please don't get hung up in Caterpillar and all the acronyms we use here. XE stands for nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It's simply just an identifier on the side of a machine. If you see the letters XE, again, it doesn't stand for anything other than what's behind it as far as a more fully featured, uh, technologically advanced machine. Um, whether that's internal components, but most importantly, you're starting to look at all the bells and whistles per se, Jason. So uh, when you are looking at that lowest unit cost, driving up profitability, because I'm in a heavy duty application, I really am gonna put an operator in there for long durations, day in and day out. It's kind of the office on the tracks, if you will. Um, that individual is gonna come and run that machine, excessive amount of hours, and really looking at leveraging grade control, the safety features of e-fence, uh, cat grade with assist, uh, payload technology, again, driving down fuel consumption, driving up fuel efficiency, and again, driving down unit overall cost and elevating our productivity. Getting that machine done on its mission as quick as we can so we can go on and achieve other work allows for expansion and growth of the company. If it would be similar to, you know, if you look at the pickup truck market, you have different trim levels depending on what, how much you want to spend and who you're buying the truck for. So okay. it would be the same kind of general concept that you have a, an application-driven Ford pickup truck for the guy that's going to go run the machine and the guy, the superintendent, and the owner. So it could be the same size truck, but just different trim levels to suit the application. So, so kind of like GC. the XLT, the Lariat, the exactly. Limited, or the Platinum. Exactly. It's a great okay. way to compare it. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and move into our next chapter. We've done a pretty good job of setting up the market and kind of basically aligning the machines and the reason for why the different choices for those markets. I'd like to take a little bit deeper dive into the specifics of those machines to, to help our audience kind of differentiate. We've talked a lot about technology. We've talked a lot about performance, you know, different features and benefits on it. Let's dive a little bit more into that, so hopefully that will help them understand the, the feature set of those machines of how it's better aligned to those uh, market profiles or those those application profiles. Mm -hmm. and I think we'll go ahead and we'll start with the uh, with the excavators, Lonnie. We'll okay. start with you talking about the next gen excavators. Hit some of those profiles and and how the GC is different from the 323 because there's not an XE in the in correct. the excavator world, is my understanding. That is correct. There is not. So you have a, a GC, a, a traditional standard machine, and mm -hmm. then you have the 323. Yeah. So if we really focus, Jason, on the features, if I was to open up a product brochure and start comparing 320 GC, 320, 323. Kind of think about it um, in, in this respect. The 320 GC is kind of on an island by itself. Um, again, you mentioned technology, Jason. A lesser featured machine, simply a rear view camera, as well as product link connectivity back to Vision Link to really see location hours fuel, for example. Um, so the GC is that simplified machine. It's designed for that lower utilization and low operating costs. I'm really concerned about when that machine is running, what does it cost me per hour? Now, when I said about dividing them into two, that 320 and 323 pair together. Uh, the significant difference is, is the duty of application, okay? So what I mean by that, let's go with technology again. Uh, grade control, 2D grade, the assist package, the e-fence and the safety side of things and the payload. Those technology features come directly out of the factory, fully integrated in the machine, which is better than anything else you can buy, being it's integrated in, uh, factory fit, on both the 2023. They're created equal. Um, again, both scalable into 2D advanced. What does that mean? That means we can do some in-field design. And then, of course, we can scale it up with 3D grade control from the factory as well as options. Um, 
what that does for us is it allows those two machines to fit into those various applications again. Um, medium to heavy duty versus heavier duty applications for the 323. How are the 20 and 23 created differently? C4.4 engine versus the 7.1, obviously putting out more horsepower and more power, more lifting capacity when you get in the 23. We also look at counterweight, heavier counterweight on that 23, heavier duty undercarriage as an option under the 23. So again, you can see how we are scaling it up, basically fitting it in um, again to um, the application profiles in those market segments. Um, again, instead of just throwing out one 320F, let's say, with a 7.1 engine, a heavy counterweight, full undercarriage, and it's going to sit in the farmer's barn, you know, for 90% of the time, again, uh, that's where I'd recommend more of a 320 GC as an application specialist. Okay, I've heard a lot about the next gen hex, and there's three big uh, buckets or profiles yeah. of all those machines. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more of the detail of, yeah. of what those three key metrics were? Yeah. I think it's operating cost, efficiency, mm -hmm. obviously fuel is going to be in there because it's a Caterpillar machine. Yeah, but. so I like to respond to those, Jason, as being those uh, really those value drivers. Uh, a lot of global project here within Caterpillars. Really, what's this mean to the customer? Okay, so uh, what Jason's mentioning there and asking is, uh, we looked at three main metrics or value drivers. Up to 15% lower uh, maintenance cost. Okay, how are we getting to that 15%? How are we really driving that down? Uh, same level ground checks as our weekly, or excuse me, our daily walk arounds. Um, they're all done from the ground level for the operator. We have aligned service intervals. Not only have we extended out the maintenance service intervals fewer filters, less hydraulic oil capacity to 20% um, as far as less hydraulic oil capacity needed in the reservoir. Um, so those things have all driven down, again, that 15% uh, in the maintenance cost. The other key uh, metric here is fuel consumption. Uh, these machines are up to 25% uh, less fuel consumption than their predecessor being the F-Series. Um, one I'm very passionate about, having come from the industry, is the operational efficiency. When we look at reductions in labor cost and material cost, um, we're up to 45% increase in operational efficiency. When we take 2D grade control coupled with CAT grade with assist, we are seeing in our production studies up to 45% gain. How are we getting there? We have less rework, operator hit an accurate grade in the fewest number of passes. We're reducing, almost eliminate material overruns. And uh, so when we start looking at the payload features and what have you, we're cutting down cycle times and just a lot of increased operational efficiency. Safety, nonetheless, is paramount. Removing that uh, grade checker from the trench 100% of the time, allowing that individual to be allocated to other resources. The pipe doesn't connect itself. We're not displacing the workforce. What we're doing is we're driving safety. We're allowing that excavator operator to get in there, get his or her work done as efficiently as possible before that pipe, for example, goes into the ground. So again, quick review, um, again, up to 15% lower maintenance costs, up to 25% lower fuel consumption, and up to 45% increase in operational efficiency, accomplished by many different ways, and I've given a few examples of those. And that's across the board for all the, all the various platforms. <clears throat> yes, that's including GC20 and 23. Perfect, let's move over to wheel loaders, Christian. Let's talk a little bit about um, a 950GC, a 950M, which is the traditional or standard machine, and then the XE platforms. Absolutely. So again, and if we go back and, and look at the 950GC and, and what it's done and, and what it does and what it was built to do. So, you know, expecting, and, and you know, aside from excavators, we, you know, for the wheel loader, the, the working envelope, the applications are a lot simplified. It's, it's, not, it's not doing everything that an excavator is being tasked to do. So it was a lot simpler for our engineers to design and, and really hone in on what does the wheel loader do, what does it have to do day in and day out to be a successful machine at the job site. So again, if we go back to look at the 950GC, it's more of, a, of the machine that's supporting some level of production but is not the main start, the, the character of the, of the production you know, unit. If we're looking at the pipe crew with the 336 and 950GC with the quick coupler bucket and forks, it is supporting that production unit to make sure that that, though, though, that pipe crew's got what it need at the right time or at the right place. If we move into the M, you've got more of, and, and sorry, going back to the 950G, so you have simplified machine as you get in the cab, if you have that pipe crew that you know, you're trying to put together for a couple months and, and you're gonna get new people, uh, with the simpler machine comes 
a little less training. When you get somebody, you know, green off the field to come in and jump in the machine, you don't have to spend as much time because you don't have the, you know, the fully featured machine inside the camp. Don't and have all the setup. You, you don't have all the setup. And, and, go to work. and you don't have a lot of buttons for them to push <laughs> to, you know, what, what does this do? And, and, and to play with those to try and figure out when, you know, task at hand is support the 336 to go dig that trench and lay the pipe. You move into the M and maybe you're pairing that with a 349, you're digging deeper, you have, you know, bigger pipe, bigger structures. Now that machine, since it's got more features, you've got maybe your 10, 15, 20 year operator that's always returning to that same machine. So you have one operator per machine who's going to get to know and enjoy the features and benefits that will drive more production for that pipe crew. Um, and then as you move forward towards the XC, you know, starting with the 966 or the 72, then that is really the fully dedicated machine driving production, lowering uh, fuel consumption, and, and you're trying to increase your production by consuming less fuel. So you're driving fuel efficiency. Um, you have the, the, the advantage of the technology and the transmission that drives the shifting and, and the experience of the machine and what it can do and the power of it. Um, and as I try to wrap my head around it, if I look at customers in the southeast, I would say, you know, if you're looking at a 980G, you're looking, you know, 980 you bought 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe the 972 MX you would be the right fit for that application, depending on what it's doing. So, um, you really provided a good visual. We're going to go ahead and put that up that lists the three different machines out. But you brought up an interesting point right now. I have a 15, 20 year old machine that was a, a 10 ton machine at that particular time, and you just said I could now do that with that same application with a 9 ton machine or an 8 ton machine? Yeah, just like all of us in the industry, as time has grown, you know, bigger is always better, right? Our machines have also grown. So if we traditionally have looked at I've always bought a 980, but <laughs> yours is a 20 year old 980, let's reevaluate what that 980 is doing. Can a new, you know, smaller machine do the same job? Okay. And keep up with production. All right, we're going to give you another viewer profile question, see how we're doing at this particular point. And the question that's going to be coming up on your screen is going to be, what do you think is the most common mistake people make when selecting a machine? First answer, Christian, just kind of led us into that and kind of, <laughs> kind of teed that one up for you. A bigger, we want a bigger machine because bigger is always better, right? I mean... I'm sure you never hear that from the customers you work with every day. Bring me yeah. the biggest and baddest machine that you have. The second potential answer that you could select is choose the lowest price option because it's the lowest price. I'm sure there's no rhyme or reason <laughs> of why we put those two at the top. Again, probably the, the second leading customer requirement, right? I want the biggest, baddest, and I want it at the lowest, lowest pro price. potential price. <laughs> the third possible answer is assuming that more weight equals more durability. That one's kind of interesting. Yes, the is. heavier the machine, it's got to be more durable, right? The 350's got to be stronger than the 150 in the, in the truck market, for example. Last but not least, uh, lack the knowledge of, of keeping them away from technology or, you know, you're afraid of the technology. You don't want to go into the, the 323, Lonnie, or the 972 MXE mm -hmm. because it's loaded up on technology. I don't understand it. It scares me, and I don't think I'm going to get the value for it. So if you guys could take a couple minutes and pick one of those four answers. Again, there is no right answer. Right. They're all valid. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> we hear them all. <laughs> they're all valid and they're all applicable. That will, again, help us drive the conversation to where we need to go. Well, that was fast. Yeah. 100% wow. letting the lack of knowledge keep them away from the technology. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Very. We'll attack that one, but we're also going to attack the other ones because... We've kind of joked and kind of humored <laughs> about bigger is better, yeah. more weights and more durable, and just give me the lowest price machine. So let's talk a little bit more in, in detail on those because okay. I want to get away from the misconception uh, by moving to our next chapter of, you know, bigger is always better. Ex explain why, True. you know, the 980 can now be a 972. Go into a little bit more detail on that for me. And so, the, yeah, if we look at the 980 from 10, 15 years ago, it was, it was designed to do that task at hand. We, we didn't have as many machines available through the machine lineup. Um, so we had one machine to do many jobs. And as you know, time has passed and we're all getting smarter and we can all measure things differently and trying to do, you know, more with less, you know, it, it, we've have machines that fit the application better today. So if you look at that older 980 and you look at what the 972 MXE can do, 
um, the cycles, the throughput, the reliability, the productivity, and the, the, you know, the tonnage per hour that that machine can deliver that we've tested internally in different, different customer sites, we can see that the 972 MXC is really a true match for, for that 20-year-old 980 machine that, that you've been running. So. And based on the number of trucks that you're loading and the size exactly. of the trucks with the bucket so size. The, so the expected productivity, you know, tons per hour or number of trucks that you need to haul out in and out of the, the plant. Okay. Same in the excavator world, I'd assume, Lonnie? Or very, it... Yeah, very similar, aligned with the wheel loaders. Um, I like to look at uh, whether it's a wheel loader bucket or an excavator bucket. You know, a lot of buckets can get heavily armed out there, put a lot of armor on them, and that's simply cutting away from the payload. You know, a, a machine can only handle so much weight hanging out there 20, 25 feet on the swing radius. So, again, bigger always being better. Um, I, I strongly encourage you to look at fuel efficiency, again, the payload availability, the cycle times and what have you, and uh, again, really choose and align your machines with your applications. Look at soil types, you know, if you're digging in really abrasive material, yeah, you look at armoring the bucket and you're going to have to give up a little bit of that capacity. If you're digging in what we like to call potato dirt, uh, your bucket will be a lot different. Bigger is not always better and heavier duty. Let's move to the price question. Why would I not want the lowest price machine for any application? Oh, that I think that's easy. Yeah. I'll take it. I mean, if yeah, you sure. look at if you if you've, you've got an application specific machine or or environment where you have got a fully dedicated machine to run production and you know it needs to do this 100% of the time, you know, 12 hour shifts or two 10 hour shifts, um, the cheapest you know the lower lowest price machine is not always going to be the best fit for that application because you're looking at runtime. You don't want the cost of downtime is so big in those applications that. Going for the lowest price isn't always going to fit that and have and enjoy the production that you're being tasked to do day in and day out. Okay. Absolutely. I totally agree. Heavier. Heavier is better. Heavier is more durable. Is that still a fact today? I mean, in the past, we have to admit, that was, that was a fact. Mm -hmm. You get the biggest, biggest machine that you can because it's the most durable, the structures are bigger, the, the gears are yeah. thicker, you know, whatever. Does that still hold true today? Yeah, kind of. Focusing on that point, like I mentioned here a little bit ago, Jason, is, is heavier is not always better. You know, it depends on your working envelope, depends on the environment you're working on. Um, again, with weight, can really couple itself with increased fuel consumption and not efficiency. So if I'm carrying around a bunch of extra weight, um, again, it's going to drive up most likely my operating cost. Um, also with repair. Um, it may be t more difficult to repair, the components might be more expensive, and I really have a machine that's, that's much heavier duty than what I need for the application. So again, weight does not always translate directly into durability, and it definitely doesn't translate into uh, more efficient. Um, again, kind of like the bigger is better. Again, it's, uh, it's really the right tool for the right job and really hitting on those applications and aligning the machine with what the task is. And I would say also, I mean, if you look spec to spec, if you're going to look at the wheel loader lineup against, you know, our competitors, uh, heavier doesn't mean more productive or a more durable machine. We, I know we spend a lot of time internally putting the weight at the right place, so it does the job that it's needed to do. So if, if we just look at the pure specs, here, this machine is this X weight and this machine is Y weight, yours is not as heavy, it probably is not as good, it's not going to do the job, you know, wrong. We spend a lot of time marrying up all the components to do the job more, most efficient, so always looking at fuel, even though fuel is not a big part of our equation today and hasn't been, but it will be in the future because you still need to fuel them and, and, you know, at some point fuel costs will go up. So it's really, we've spent a lot, a lot of time and intentional uh, effort in making sure that it all works as a system and it's not just, you know, wait. It's, it's okay. doing the top, doing the job and doing it right. Real quick, let's talk on the technology. Most of our mm -hmm. viewers were 100% technology, a little bit afraid of that. Mm -hmm. Real quick, talk about, you know, the technology. The GC, as you've mentioned several times, is limited on technology Correct. where yeah. the standard of traditional gets a little bit more technology and then you go all the way to the other end of the spectrum. So. What's important about understanding the technology and, and applying that to the different applications? Yeah, so first and foremost, a, a frame I like to have coined is, is the fact that technology is not a cost, it's an investment. I know there can be a little bit of a technology barrier out there uh, depending on you know the area you come from. And looking at my son that's seven years old and can do about anything on an iPad and an iPhone. So a lot of it's just acceptance of that technology, really uh, the right technology for the right application, okay? So if we're looking at 
an example we've used a lot here because it fits so nicely is underground utilities. If I'm really going to be in that excavator day after day laying pipe and really needing to achieve grade as quick as I can, as accurately as I can, really looking at technology to achieve that grade, drive down that unit overall cost. So I'm really looking at 2D grade control, possibly even 3D with the assist features. Um, so again, um, really driving efficiencies, Jason, really looking at technology where it fits into play. Um, I highly encourage those of you that haven't adopted technology, really give a hard and fast look at it. Ease your way into it. Technologies are scalable. Uh, the dealer network is out there to support you. Rent before you buy. Really look at all the choices. Do your homework and really give technology a strong look because um, most importantly, we want a happy operator. A happy operator and a comfortable operator is going to be a productive operator, right? They're going to keep coming back and wanting to work for you, and that technology really does a lot for you. There's some of our technologies, Jason, that drive down operator input by up to 80%, and okay. uh, it's really key in, in looking at adoption and the value. We're going to go ahead and move to our next chapter uh, to keep things moving here on the time frame, and that is what's most important to, to our customers? How do you choose the right machine? What are, what are some of the tips um, and what are some of the things you guys would recommend for making sure that you choose the right machine for the application? Yeah, I can take that one lead off here, Jason. Uh, a lot of things to be considered at when you're, you're looking at the right tool for the right job, the right machine uh, for the task. Um, underfoot conditions, do I need a wider platform? You know, and excavators again, what, is, what lift capacity am I needing? You know, a GC, very honestly, doesn't have the lifting capacity that a 320 has, and a 323 has more lifting capacity than a 20. Um, what type of material am I digging in? You know, am I digging in a soft, sandy material? Maybe a GC, not to say it can't dig in other materials, all the way up to the scale of my really, again, back into that rock, am I doing that heavy hammering and what have you? Um, really, again, looking at application because each one of them is designed, whether it's a light duty application, a moderate duty, heavy duty application, they're really designed uh, to fit into the right application profile, the segment in the market. Um, so that is really the key when we start looking at uh, what is the task at hand? Do I need productivity, Jason, in my back to, I'm just concerned about how much this machine's cost me per hour, or I'm really concerned about how much this pipe has cost me per foot in the ground. And that really sets up the machine I'm needing. It's kind of like size in the right bucket. Right, and I would say, you know, same thing for the wheel loader is, is you're looking um, I, I'd say all customers are driven, you know, production, production, production. But when you break it down to what is the job, how do I finish it, and you have your different crews, different crews will do different things. So I know when, when the equipment managers or the fleet managers are looking, you know, where do I send this crew and this guy? If you're looking at, at the GC, it's again for, for that, you know, application where it, it's a standby machine, it's supporting a, a unit of production, it's out there, you've got operators where the skill level is not there, so you've got a more simplified machine, easier to ease into, and, and you kind of join your company through that as you work your, your years into the, into the company. You look at more to performance and, and product, you know, productivity segments. Again, it's more of that dedicated machine, your dedicated operator, people that have been with you and know the machine and know the production at hand. And, and for the most part, my experience, customers know, you know, they know their underfoot conditions, they know their soil conditions, they know what they need to do. Before they start. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Before but, they bid. <laughs> <laughs> but they've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years longer than, you know, I've been supporting them in, in their industry. So it, it, they know what they need to do it and how to do it, but really our machines are there to, to be that tool and the right tool, and we want to help them make sure that they know that we have the tools to help them for each segment. So usage attributes are important. Let, let's take a look at uh, one of the things that you guys have developed on, on helping customers select or the slide rule or the slider mm -hmm. for next-gen excavators. Um, we'll go ahead and pop that visual up and then have you guys kind of talk about where this came from and, and what this is really trying to define or help yeah. a, a customer with. Absolutely. So like Jason mentioned, as you see here on your screen, really understanding those usage attributes and the lineup of the GC320 and 323 um, in order with the, the gray, the more orangish color, and then the yellow dot there. And really how we set this up is looking at the fuel efficiency, you know, looking at the utilization, looking at how you're paid. Again, paid by the hour, paid by the unit, and driving down that hourly cost. We talked a little bit about material. You know, am I a lower density material, higher density material, heavier weight? You know, do I need that balance in the machine? Kind of what uh, Christian was mentioning there is we put a lot of time into machine balance. I don't care if some machine we haven't talked about here is a track type tractor. You know, putting a ripper on the back to balance with the big blade on the front. 
The same goes for excavators and wheel loaders. It's all about machine balance and really uh, fitting it into the select applications. Again, on the side of maybe I'm using it a low hour utilization and lighter duty applications on the GC, all the way up to those heavier duty applications as you see there. And again, back to the big T word I like to call is technology. You know, uh, lesser featured machine like a GC, all the way up to the fully featured uh, 320 and 323. So a lot of different attributes we look at there is where are you at when you start sliding that bar back and forth on the scale? Um, it really underscores and highlights, Jason, that we have created machines to fall into the applications that are all across the globe in creating, like I like to say, uh, matching the machine to the mission. And then for the wheel loaders, they seem, it's the same thing as we have gone out and, and captured that voice of the operator, that voice of the fleet manager, voice of the owner, and then trying to put, bring it back here, make sense of it all. Um, that's where we kind of have to hone in and focus on, the, on those must, you know, customer requirements on when we go in into in, in designing the machine. So if you, if you look at the GC and, and the simplicity of it, and then you look at the standard and fully featured machine and what it does for the operator, the fleet manager, and the owner of the machine, just the data and, 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 and the, you know, response time and everything that the machine has in it, it's, it's far greater. Perfect. We're going to go ahead and move into our last section um, real quick, and that's going to be you make the call. We're going to put you guys on the spot. I'm going to give you a scenario. You'll see a viewer poll question pop up, and you get to select the machine based on the usage attributes that are provided. So the first one, we'll, we'll talk about an excavator. It's site development, new construction, underground utility. So we're doing some trenching. We're going to be putting in some pipe. 80% um, average utilization, and we're on an extremely tight schedule and budget. Reviewing those parameters, there's going to be a question that's going to pop up. So what type of excavator would you use for the situation described above? New construction site development. Don't You guys don't be holding up any fingers or winking at anything. So. <laughs> Underground utility, 80% utilization, and a tight schedule and budget. Would it be a 320GC, a 320, or a 323 would be the best machine for those parameters? Go ahead and answer that question on your screen. Uh, again, they'll pop up here on my iPad and I'll let you know if you're right or wrong and how well we've done through this <laughs> webinar on defining these. Yeah, that Is this how we're graded? <laughs> <laughs> so again, we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. One of the, um, I think what's probably going to throw people off is we threw in that 80% average utilization yeah. and a tight schedule and budget. <laughs> and then we, didn't really, we didn't really talk about utilization percentages throughout the whole right. yeah. chat, yeah. so that's we talk a lot. Yeah, yeah. We talked a little bit about low and moderate utilization, moderate and heavy utilization, and then uh, again, high utilization. So, hint, hint. I don't know if they're a little nervous to answer or not, but we'll help you out on that one. The answer would be a 323. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well done. I don't know. I'd say more well done to the audience. I'm not going to take any credit for it, but uh, I think, uh, if anything, hopefully we've expanded your knowledge today on the excavator and the wheel loader side. But uh, just a point to underscore and to, uh, to really gravitate towards there, and Jason said, hint, hint, 80% utilization. Okay, so we're looking at a higher utilization. A couple other details there in the question uh, that were key parts to consider is uh, new site construction. So an assumption could be made, and I know your estimating department would already have done this, is this may be undisturbed soil. So our soil density may be a little higher. Not so much the weight, but the actual in-place density. It hasn't been disturbed, it hasn't been fluffed up. Um, we're on a tight schedule, and we have a very tight budget, okay? So what are we looking for? Well, who's not on a tight schedule? It, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Tight budget, I want productivity. It kind of goes back to the biggest, heaviest machine at the lowest cost, right? But uh, point being is, um, if we're on a tight budget, are we looking for so much that hourly cost? I'm just concerned what's going No, I'm looking at what's in the ground. I need to right. drive down unit and overall cost. Can't say it enough. Um, as a former project manager, I always said, if I'm ahead of schedule and under budget, I'm doing my job. And uh, so again, hence the 323, put it in there and let it be your workhorse. Let's try another one. We're gonna to move to a wheel loader one this time. Again, your parameters for the, you make the call for the wheel loader selection are site development, new construction. It's an underground utility application. So um, obviously a wheel loader can't dig a trench. Right. So it's supporting something that's digging a trench. 60% utilization and fuel efficiency is a priority. So again, there's going to be a viewer poll question that's going to pop up on your screen, and we're going to ask you to pick the best machine for this scenario. Site development, new construction, underground utility, 60% utilization, 
and fuel efficiency is important. Would it be a 950GC, a 950M, or the 966MXE slash 972MXE? We'll give you a couple minutes to pick on that one. And again, I think what's probably going <laughs> to twist our audience a little bit is the utilization one, I think they're probably going to understand that from the excavator one, but the fuel efficiency is a priority. Yeah. I think that's going to probably sway some I think so. answers or some changes. <laughs> Hopefully we explained it enough in the last <laughs> yeah. 35 minutes. And Jason, if I could just take this 30 seconds while the viewers are uh, responding there correctly. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about underground utilities, and please don't mistake in us that our machines can only go in underground utilities. I know there's many types of customers out there, many segments, many, many applications. You know, an excavator loading off a bench, same level loading, uh, land clearing, uh, demolition, putting a thumb on those 320s and 323s numerous ac uh, applications you know it's it's like we like to say here internally it's the swiss army knife you know the excavator can do many things you know we can go on on hammering and and all these different things so uh again it, it really drives the message pretty clear when we look at excavators paired yep. up with uh, wheel loaders but uh, just to underscore our machines are built for many applications your poll question's back and i can tell you that nobody got an f again the key in that particular scenario the rest is kind of noise but the key would be the 60 percent utilization yeah. it's a lesser use exactly machine. so yeah. we have about uh nine minutes left we're going to go ahead and move to some of the questions that um, i didn't get a chance to weave into the conversation throughout um, so we'll go ahead and we'll start with those um, this one I think is a good one, and let's tackle this one first. Is a GC a lesser quality machine? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No way. And then, I mean, not not in a way that we've have you know like, much like customers, we've intentionally set our time, energy, and research and developing and developing a machine that will do the job at hand. So it, it's an application specific machine, but it by no means is lesser quality than what you expect of a cat machine. So much like you won your 950M, 336, 320, D6C, D6N, it is the same reliability and quality that we built. Okay. Let's take another one. When integrating a bunch of technology, doesn't it just add costs? <laughs> well, as, let's go back about 15 minutes when I said, uh, in our perspective and in the industry's perspective, technology is not a cost, it's an investment, Jason. So the right technology for the application will not drive up cost, it's gonna drive down cost. Um, our studies have proven this. I led a study that was uh, comparing traditional ways versus technology ways in road construction application. And again, um, just take for example, grade control. We're out there up to 45% gain. If you go out and slash labor cost, the hours on the machine by up to 45%, Technology is truly an investment. If it's not bringing an ROI, yes, it's not necessary. But um, you know, a lot of people look at that upfront cost and acquisition, but if you really cast that out over the life of that machine, it is putting money in your pocket. Okay, let's take another one. 25% fuel savings that you guys talked about is a lot. Have you really achieved that? And if so, how have you, how, how have you achieved that? Yeah. yeah, so exactly, up to 25%. Uh, lower fuel consumption, uh, again, that fuel efficiency versus the predecessor, the F-Series, accomplished many ways. Again, a lot of it's in the engine, a lot of it's in the pumps, uh, very simply. Uh, turn down those RPMs a little bit on the engine. You say, oh, yeah, there went my power. No wonder it's more efficient. Absolutely not. As we turn down the RPMs, get these machines to sip the fuel instead of guzzling the fuel, Jason, we have upsized the pumps. Um, we went to electronic fans. There's a series of electronic fans in these machines to keep them cooler, as well as to drive down the fuel consumption uh, that the fans originally um, were creating. So, again, a lot of the in intricacies of the machine that we're getting this fuel efficiency, not to say even the productivity that's driving up fuel efficiency, different than consumption. I'm sure the next thing that's going to come with that, all right, you got 25% fuel savings, so how much productivity did I actually lose out of that? Yeah because they usually go hand in hand. Yeah, right. less fuel, less productive. Right. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And again, it's all in tuning the machine. So out of all the research and development, out of the engineering department, out of the product group, again, bringing down the uh, need for that fuel. You know, kind of think of it as running the marathon, a person that's not so well in shape is a person that's really in shape. These machines are really in shape, okay? That engine's not working as hard because we have increased the capacity of those pumps. So if we put 
our apples in the right baskets here. We're saying, hey, I'm going to turn that engine down just a little bit on the RPM, get my fuel consumption down, but I'm going to upsize the pump. The pump's not requiring the fuel, okay? It's increasing the capacity to really respond to the demands the operator's putting that machine through, so its productivity is actually an increase. So it's not a trade-off, it's a benefit. So make sure I understand this, and I'm going to kind of date myself here. When I was younger, you wanted a 455 mm -hmm. or a 454 engine if you're going to make some money on weekends drag racing people, right? <laughs> now my daughter has a four-cylinder engine mm -hmm. that produces more horsepower and torque than no matter what you could add on to a right. 454 or 455 yeah. engine. I mean, yeah. same, same type of philosophy, correct? Yeah. Let's look at it this way, Jason. Let's go to something we're all real common with. How big were the first computers? Size of rooms, buildings. Yeah. Size, yeah, of, yeah. size <laughs> of room compared to how much electricity were they pulling and how fast were they not? Okay, much smaller, run by a battery, and super lightning fast. Okay, so similar to that, things evolve over time. We continue to pour almost a million dollars in R&D a day, and there's good reason for that. There's value behind it, and it's things like this. You know, we've made it through the tier four final, gotten past all the emissions type things with impeccable machines. Now we can really focus on efficiency, and our components are getting better. Our technology behind the machines are getting better. You know, we're, we're lowering those operating costs. We're lowering those maintenance costs, and again, fuel, you know, there'll be a machine, I'm sure, that uh, becomes out even more efficient than this, and we continue to progress down this road of evolving into more efficient machines and tweaking different things. You know, who would have thought by putting an electric fan series in there would have really drove down fuel consumption, up fuel efficiency. Been doing it for years. Exactly. So nothing you know, 20 years ago, it was like everything had to be mechanically driven. Yeah, that, that takes some energy to power all those it things. It takes horsepower, it takes fuel. Exactly. Like. Something's got to be behind the powering to make the, you know, those components really function. So, again, many tweaks over the product line. That's why this launch has been so monumental, because of all these great changes that are really, again, I can't say it enough, folks. If I'm driving down cost, I'm keeping money in my pocket. I'm not selling it out to the fuel supplier. I'm not putting it into labor. All right, we've got time for one last question. And again, they're really honing in on our, our numbers here. <laughs> Up to 45% operating efficiency is simply huge. How did you measure that? And can all operators see or get the same result? Yeah, yeah so excellent question. A big number. Um, up to a 45% operational efficiency. So this is all cards in on the deck, okay? So this is comparing, again, I mentioned I ran a study of traditional construction versus te technology, okay? Traditional ways of doing things. What do I mean by traditional? Familiar with eye levels, stick rules, paint cans, tape measures, doing it traditionally off of hubs, off of grade hubs and information provided by the engineer versus giving the operator all those technologically advanced tools that they need. So I simply touch a grade hub here, I go down with my 2D grade control with assist, and I'm able to achieve grade on my own with some grade verification, creating a smooth grade, driving down labor costs, driving down material overruns, driving down my cycle times. So when you put all these in, again, it's not just specifically on the operator, it's operational efficiency. When I start piling on all these savings, I can really drive down unit overall costs really quick. So again, focus on, it's just, I'm not that much more productive. I am more productive, but that's not the end of the equation. There's many things that go into what I like to term it as operational efficiency. Let's shift gears real quick here, Jason, if I can borrow 15 seconds. Look at tractors, grade control technology on a dozer. Many, many articles out there touting, touting up to half the time. They're saving almost 50% because of technology. It's grade control technology. It's of that whole work environment on that job site. It's not just simply what the operator is giving. It's all cards in. Okay. okay? So a huge ad advantage. And again, it's an investment, folks, not a cost. All right, we're down to our last two minutes, so I'm going to have to wrap it up. I'd really like to thank both of you for spending the, the morning with us here in Absolutely. the Caterpillar thank TV studios. <laughs> Before we leave you, I want to again uh, draw your attention to that lower left-hand box on your screen in front of you. Again, you'll find several links to the information that we talked about today. A lot of the visuals that the guys provided will be in that um, location. The Ask the Expert is also there. That's a direct link where you can ask a Caterpillar expert any type of question that you would have. I sit on the panel. Lonnie sits on the panel along with some of our other experts. Type in your question. We'll get you an answer back within 48 hours or we get in trouble. <laughs> and again, the Heavy Construction Newsletter, we'd like you to sign up for that. That'll give you 
um, updates on future webinars that are coming throughout 2018, as well as new product technologies, services, and solutions offered by Caterpillar. Lastly, I'd really like to thank you for spending uh, the time with us today, the hour talking about machine choices, how to select the machine, the difference in the market segments, and the application profiles. Thank you for your time, and I hope wish you a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.